all set upstairs? Yeah. Call to order the uh, Planning and Zoning Board meeting for the City of Tarpon Springs, January 12th, 2015 at 7.01 p.m. We'll let's begin with the roll call. Mrs. Protos? Here. Mr. Parker? Mr. Carr? Here. Mr. Hase? Here. Mr. Gialusis? Ms. St. Arnold? Here. Chairman Vinson? Here. First item on the agenda is for the approval of the minutes of the <coughs> meeting of November 17, 2014. Move for approval. Is second. there a second? Second. second. There's a motion and a second for approval. All in favor? Oh, well. Madam Clerk, take a roll call vote, please. Mrs. Protos? Yes. Mr. Carr? I can vote on this either over here, right? To the right? Mm -hmm. Do I need to? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Hasse? Yes. Ms. St. Arnold? Yes. <coughs> Chairman Vinson? Yes. The board attorney will uh, uh, review the judicial, quasi judicial <coughs> announcement uh, to inform everyone about the procedures and quasi judicial hearings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. These are quasi-judicial proceedings where this board acts in a quasi-judicial capacity. This board is not the final decision maker on the applications before this evening. It is advisory to the Board of Commissioners. Its job is to make a recommendation to the Board of Commissioners on the applications before it. By law, it is this board's function at this hearing to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented and apply those findings of fact to previously established criteria contained in the city's code to make a decision regarding the application before it. The board may only consider evidence that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues arising from the application and the applicable code sections. If that evidence demonstrates that the applicant has met the criteria established in the code, the board is required by law to recommend in favor of the applicant. By the same token, if that evidence demonstrates the applicant has failed to meet those criteria, the board is required to recommend against the applicant. The parties to this hearing are the applicant and the city. The city is represented by city staff. There may be persons, organizations, or groups that qualify as interveners. Persons or groups that qualify for intervener status may, can participate in the hearing as a party. A recognized intervener may examine witnesses, present evidence, and make arguments to the board. For a person to be granted intervener status, the person must demonstrate to the board that he or she will suffer an adverse effect as a result of the quasi-judicial decision which exceeds in degree that which may be suffered by the general community. Intervener status may be granted to the representative of an organization or group of persons who have a substantial and compelling interest in the matter under consideration if that organization or group can demonstrate that it is prepared to present competent and substantial evidence which would be of significant assistance to the board in making its decision. In a few minutes, the chairperson will give persons, organizations, or groups desiring intervener status the opportunity to make that request. There is an established procedure which will be followed at this quasi-judicial hearing. All witnesses must give their testimony under oath. All persons testifying must give their name and address for the record. All testimony and questioning must address matters that are relevant and material to the issues under consideration. The city staff will present its testimony and evidence first. The applicant and recognized interveners will have an opportunity to cross-examine city staff and any city witnesses. The applicant will then present its witnesses and evidence. The city staff and recognized interveners will have an opportunity to cross-examine the applicant's witnesses. Recognized interveners will then present their evidence and witnesses. City staff and the applicant will have the opportunity to cross-examine the intervener's witnesses. Absent unusual circumstances to be determined by the board, a party's opening statement and presentation is limited to 10 minutes. At that point, we'll proceed to the public comment portion of the meeting. Members of the public opposing the application will be given an opportunity to present testimony. After all members of the public opposing the application have concluded, members of the public in support will have an opportunity to present testimony. Each member of the public is limited to four minutes. A member of an organization or group granted intervener status who testifies as part of the group's presentation forfeits the right to speak during the public comment portion of the meeting. During the public comment portion of the meeting, members of the public present at the hearing may donate their time to a speaker to extend that speaker's time, but in doing so, the person donating the time forfeits his or her right to speak. Each donation shall extend the speaker's time an additional two minutes, but in no event shall the speaker's time be extended beyond 10 minutes of total speaking time. 
Following public comment, the applicant, city staff, and recognized interveners will have an opportunity to present rebuttal evidence and make a closing argument or summary. The applicant will go first, followed by city staff and any interveners, absent unusual circumstances to be determined by the board. A party's closing summary and rebuttal evidence will be limited to 10 minutes each. Following this, the board will consider the matter. I would ask at this time for all witnesses who intend to testify tonight, either as a party or intervener, to please stand and be sworn. I ask you to raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you are about to give in this proceeding is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Thank you. Thank you. I'd ask at this time whether there are any conflicts of interest on the board that should be disclosed at this juncture on any of the applications before you tonight. Seeing none, I'll ask whether there are any ex parte communications on any of the applications before you tonight. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Daniel. <clears throat> First, uh, the next item on the agenda is the application 14-72 conditional use permit for city reclaimed water facilities. Mr. Chairman, if you would, before you start, please ask for intervener status on any of the applications before us tonight uh, so that we uh, can get that out of the way. Uh, do we have any persons or organizations who wish to uh, seek intervener status that was described to you by our board attorney? Thank you. Hello, um, by now you know who I am, Joshua Langan, principal planner here. I'm going to go ahead and give a brief overview of, of my staff report here, and then I'll have Bob Robertson come in and uh, better explain the project. He's the engineer in charge. Um, what you have here is you have a two-part, you have two items here relating to the same project. We need a conditional use permit to simply allow public facilities in this zoning district, and then we need a site plan. So. What you're looking at is some facilities related to, related to reclaimed water, a tank, and some uh, piping and, and, and such. Um, you can see the, we, the city, are the applicant. We are attempting to locate these facilities on our golf course. The golf course is very big. It's a very large um, piece of property with trees and uh, the ability to, to put facilities in various places. Uh, the land development code well, it does allow for this sort of thing, but we have to get a conditional use permit, which is why we're here today. Um, the um, property appears uh, appropriate. Like I said, it's a very large piece of property, so it's the kind of thing we're not trying to just squish on here. It's uh, it can be placed uh, in an advantageous location. Uh, it's consistent with the goals, objectives, policies of this comprehensive plan. Um, you'll see more of that in the site plan review. Uh, will not. Re result in a significant adverse impact on the environment, um, will not uh, adversely affect adjoining property values, uh, you know, and I'll say that I know that the city has done public workshops uh, sort of around the city, and uh, they've shown pictures, they've shown renderings, they've shown what it's going to look like, and uh, I, I believe they put it in the best possible place uh, to give us water and minimize impact. Uh, it's really more near the road and near the golf course than to potential homes. Um, it certainly will not accept, you know, affect the ability or, or exceed the city's ability to provide water because, well, that's the whole point here is we're providing more facilities. We're providing more capacity. So that's sort of a brief overview. Uh, basically, staff's recommendation, uh, at least from the planning and zoning department, is to recommend approval of the conditional use. And I'll go ahead and let uh, Mr. Robinson add, add to this. Uh, unless you wanted to ask me questions before I leave the podium. Should we take these separately uh, since they're related, these two applications, one for conditional use and one for the site plan? Uh, that's at the board's leisure, Mr. Chairman. I, I would recommend that since they are related, uh, it might be easier to do one presentation. You'll need to take two votes on the, on the separate applications, but the presentations could certainly be made together. Uh, I agree. If there's no objections uh, from the board members, let's do that to... Uh, make it easier for the staff as well as uh, for us, and, and we'll just do it with two motions though, to consider at the end. All right, I'll give a brief run through then of uh, application 1473, and then we'll let Bob come in and um, finish up. 1473 is the associated site plan, the same project. Uh, much of the background is the same here, and the only thing I'll point out is when you start reading our comprehensive plan, it, we do have goals to provide, you know, public facilities to, to 
provide facilities in a cost-effective manner. Um, you know, we have utilities goals of, of having potable water, of having reclaimed water. Uh, of, we, we have goals of setting 75% offset of uh, our potable water by reclaimed water. Um, with regards to current currency, this will, you know, of course, only help not only the city, but future projects meet concurrency because we're increasing the capacity of, the, of our water supply. So uh, similar to the other one, uh, staff does recommend uh, support of the project and does recommend approval. So I'll go ahead and, and let Bob go ahead and talk about these two. Thanks, Josh. Um, again, my name is Bob Robertson. I work for the city. I'm the public services program manager. I'm an engineer. And with me tonight is Emily Moore from Tetra Tech, the engineering firm that did most of the design work for the project. I don't really have much more to add from what Josh said other than to tell you that this is a, a, a reclaimed water project. Um, as he said, it provides offset of potable water, reclaimed water using for irrigation instead of potable water. So it does, in fact, extend potable water supply. Um, it is a, a 5 million gallon storage tank and a pump station and piping that goes with it. We currently have 4 million gallons of storage for reclaimed water in the city. So this more than doubles our supply. Um, it's a nice size project. I will also add that the project is cooperatively funded by the Southwest Florida Mo Water Management District. About 46% of the, the funding comes from the Water Management District. And if there's any questions, or are here to answer them. Uh, can you explain um, the presentations to the community that uh, the staff has done or the city has done? Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, we had two large um, uh, public involvement, public uh, information meetings. The first, they were both held at the golf course. The first was in October, and we did a, uh, a hang tag public ad notification for all the communities directly adjacent to the golf course, and then some even beyond that. Uh, something to the effect of 500 hang tags we put out. Um, we did that meeting in October, and uh, we noticed that no one from the Green Dolphin showed up, which is the most uh, close, the closest facility to the golf course. And we said, well, that's really odd. Um, let's make sure that they, we get their input because they're going to be the most closely affected by this. So we had another public meeting. In this case, in this instance, we went to each and every resident at the Green Dolphin and distributed that information uh, brochure that you have in front of you, the big full color one there, as well as a special invitation. Um, and we got a pretty good turnout for that. I'm gonna be making a presentation to the Board of Commissioners tomorrow night, as a matter of fact, where I go through um, some of the major questions that we got from public comment. Um, things like, uh, what about the color of the tank? Can we make it a nicer color? We came up with a nice green instead of the beige and white that you see in your backup. Um, can we bury the tank? Um, how deep can we go? And we actually did. We're able to lower it about five feet on average. As long as we stay above the groundwater table, we, we can do that. The one that you see there is right at ground level, so it's going to be a little bit deeper than that. Uh, can we move it up to the north? And indeed, we did. We were able to shift it just a little bit, um, staying within the, uh, uh, the floodplain boundaries, staying outside of the floodplain, excuse me. So we listened. We did the best we could with, with what we had to, to try to accommodate some of the, the, the public's questions and concerns. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question, two actually. How long does it, how long will this project take and what effect will it have on the golfers at the, uh, that we get revenue from? First question, how long will it take? Um, assuming the board gives us authorization to move forward to bid the project for construction, I'm thinking in about March timeframe we'll be able to, to begin construction. Um, construction estimates put us roughly around September for completion. Um, doesn't take that long to build these tanks. Surprisingly, these companies that specialize in these tanks, they they know what they're doing. They're very they're they're pros. Um, I'm sorry. What was the second question? Second question: What does it affect the the players at all? Well, I've heard jokingly that it's going to be a great big target. Um, <laughs> but um, one of the uh, effects of shifting that tank to the north a little bit was it takes a little bit further out of play from, I believe it's Fairway Two. It had to make a turn, um, and now it shifts it back a little bit further out of the way there. So from um, the informal interviews I've had with other golfers, it doesn't seem to be too much of an effect on, on golf course play. The only one site, uh, if one, one hold that it'll affect is the tee box for, I think it's number seven, 
Is that it? Number nine. It has to get shifted a little bit to the northeast to make room for the tank, and we have to re redirect a cart path. But other than that, the, it doesn't change the distance of that hole or anything. I have a few questions. Will it affect any way the ball fields or young people who have the recreation there in their soccer fields and, and baseball fields there? No, the, um, the piping goes around the ball fields. It doesn't even come through them. Um, and the tank is far enough away that it'd have to be a pretty awesome home run for you to hit that, ta hit that tank. Uh, there wasn't any other property available to put that tank except for the golf course, because we used to have a PGA golf course here. Yeah. And uh, I've heard some of the golfers, I've overheard them talking, you know, and uh, I'm not a golfer, so the concern was you know, getting interference with their uh, with their uh, times and their games and stuff. Yeah, I, I can understand that concern, and, and that's why we did do some informal interviews with, with golfers. And um, to answer your question, there, we did look at other sites, but the golf course is really the ideal site for many reasons. The first is that um, it's in close proximity to most of the residents that we're going to be expanding to, West Bend's, Oak Leaf, Grassy Point, um, and the Castle Works area. Um, those are the areas that have shown the most interest in receiving reclaimed water. So there's, there's that factor. The other is that the single largest user of reclaimed water in Tarvin Springs is the golf course. So putting it on the golf course makes a whole lot of sense for a lot of reasons, but uh, one is your proximity to supply. The second is we get to utilize the existing infrastructure for irrigation. We don't have to, we don't have to supercharge this water to put it at high pressure to irrigate the golf course. The golf course can continue to use its existing system. So there's a whole bunch of advantages. Another site we thought about, and a question I got was, can we put it over at the landfill? That's a nice big open site, a nice big tank would look good there and might fit there. Um, issues there are wetlands in that landfill, and then of course you've got a capped landfill. So anytime you build something on the landfill cap, you, you probably will have to puncture that cap. Um, it's not just putting something on the surface, you've got loads on that uh, that you've got to sustain, which would require pilings or some alternative foundation. So the landfill, aside from all the crazy permitting issues you might face, was, was a site we looked at and had to eliminate. So the golf course really wound up being the best location. Uh, in reading this, and I'm not an engineer, will uh, that holding tank in any way help alleviate the overflow that the county's been working on in that pond at the golf course and alternate 19? That's a really good question, um, and in fact, I believe it will, because for one main reason, the way the irrigation system works now, the reclaimed water from the wastewater tank, from the wastewater system, wastewater plant, excuse me, is pumped to the golf course and stored on those ponds. So that's reclaimed water, that's irrigation water that's occupying stormwater storage on the site. There's a couple great advantages. One, we're not going to be using that pond quite as much, and we still will need it, but not nearly as much. So that moves that and creates more uh, storage available for stormwater, just as, as the point you're making. The other is that we're going to make better use of, of that reclaimed water, because water that goes in those unlined ponds gets lost to evaporation and percolation, and it's really inefficient uh, use way to store reclaimed water. So if we can put it in a tank, we can use every drop of it instead of losing it to evaporation, and we create that volume, avail make that mo volume available for stormwater. Very good. I think so. Start working on the third one in my area. The third one in your area, okay. <laughs> Any other questions from the board? I've got a couple questions. Go ahead. I just want to confirm, this is it's just a holding tank, right, and some pipes. It's not open air <clears throat> like we have across the street at all? It is. A, yeah, it's a holding tank. It's a, okay. it's a closed, enclosed, domed storage tank. Compared to the ones we have across the street with the cool purple lines around the top of them, um, size-wise, are those relatively close to the same height, or what are we looking at? Be about the same height, but much larger in diameter. Lighter. Yeah, right. those are two million gallons each. So this one's going to be five million gallons. Pretty big. Yeah. Um, I think, it w I mean, I, we don't have to talk about necessarily color isn't really what we focus on here, but I think a green would ultimately end up fading, and then you have to paint it more than, like, the sand brown that you guys were initially talking about. And uh, But that's neither. And I've got a couple of questions just about how you guys are going to cover it up. I see there's, like, a some guidelines with, Looks like uh, trees are going to be playing around the outside of the the tank. Mm -hmm. um, I was just curious. It looks like 
I mean, you've got some tall trees, you've got some, a lot of flower blooming trees. Um, I mean, was there a talk of like cedars more, um, really just to kind of block it off entirely from the green dolphin or whatever it may be looking at it? Because when you look at it, it's still going to be a sore eye yeah. uh, looking at it. So I think there's potentially there's a better chance to plant more maybe on the east side of the tank to really buffer that. Because, I mean, we're looking from the, the north side of the tank is really the ball field. It's not that big of an issue. Right. South side, I mean, there's a lot of golf course on the south side, I think, and then even to the west. There might be some wetlands or something. So, um, was there more thought into putting maybe something else that substantially could really buffer it off instead of maybe 10 years, 15 years down the road, it's finally buffered off? Yeah, as a matter of fact, this just in. Um, <laughs> one of the species that we had designated in, in the plans um, is prohibited in the ordinance. I didn't realize that when we did it. It's the uh, Norfolk pines, Norfolk Island pines. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. uh, that's what I hear. Um, so those are coming out of the plant set, and we're going to replace those. And <clears throat> we were just talking this evening about replacing those with a red cedar or something to that effect. Okay. And most of the plantings are going to be on that east side and, and north side, as um, you say. Another question I have, too, is that makes sense. And I think that's a, a good choice on that. Um, you've got a longleaf pine. Uh, we've got there's pine trees all over the golf course. Yeah. And being familiar with irrigation systems, pump houses, and stuff along those lines, lightning strikes are like, they're a great lightning strike conductor <clears throat> is a longleaf uh, pine. Um, but and those will blow out all types of valves and all types of issues. Has, I mean, has that been considered at all with putting those in around the tank, around the pump house, putting longleaf pines in when they get to be about 40, 60 feet? What's gonna happen when the lightning strike strikes these trees and goes into the pumps and blow them out? Um, is that, I mean, have we talked about that? Have we kind of looked at other alternatives to prohibit that with lightning rods or whatever it may be. So. Well, it may be a situation where when those trees start to get to those heights that we prune them back and replace them with some other trees to sort of keep a, a, a lush uh, screening there. But to, to go towards the lightning side, um, these tanks are typically provided with a cathodic protection and lightning protection. So they, you know, they, they build the, they put a big wire and then and lightning rods that go all the way up to these tanks to sure. dissipate the charge so you don't have that, that risk. Okay. Yeah, you don't, um, uh, what your comment to you usually I don't trim pine trees, but that's well, up to what I meant was you can cut them off, though. come down. They can be soft, I think. Um, okay, <clears throat> that's uh, all the questions I have. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions before our next uh, presenter? Actually, I have one more question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. How can you explain how is this coming in? Um, I see that there's a pipeline coming through. Uh, by the ball fields, where, where's the inflow and outflow? Is it the same pipe, or is it a? Yeah, um, we're actually gonna we're gonna put a, a double barrel piping. <laughs> Two pipes are gonna run up through there so that we can fill the tank and draw from the tank at the same time with a with a valving a valve in between at the connection point there. So this, the system is isolated so that it can be very flexible. Great, thanks. Sure. question. The city has met every criteria that they're supposed to? Yes, they have. They've, uh, they've given a full submittal. And the reason I'm asking this is because I've been accused of asking too many times, have applicants met all their criteria? Yeah, I understand. So that's why I'm doing it to the city, so we'll stay in the same mode. The city was very thorough. Very thorough. They submitted a very complete package. I see that in the report, package. and thank you very much. Well, thanks for the, report. I'll thank the engineering department for doing all the work. <laughs> Any other presentation on the behalf of the uh, city for this application, for either one of the applications? Uh, no. <clears throat> uh, this time we'll open the, uh, the floor uh, for public comment, either for or against. Let's start if there's anyone who would like to speak for on behalf of the applicant, uh, the application of the city. This is both for the conditional use as well as for the site plan. Seeing none, is there anyone that wishes to speak uh, against the project, either one of these? Seeing none, we'll close the public portion of the, uh, the hearing and uh,
We'll now take comments from the board, board discussion, or open it for a motion and then discussion. Remember, we'll need two motions, two separate motions, so let's do it one at a time. The first one would be the conditional use application. So move for the approval of application 1472, conditional use permit for city reclaimed water facilities. I'll second. second. Okay, Mr. Carr seconded. Uh, any discussion on the conditional use application by the board? Call the question. Madam Clerk, you want to roll call for the vote? Mrs. Protos? Yes. Mr. Carr? Yes. Mr. Hussig? Yes. Ms. St. Arnold? Yes. Chairman Vincent? Yes. That takes care of the conditional use. And next would be consideration of the application 1473, the site plan for the uh, city reclaimed water facilities. Is there a motion? I'll make Second. a motion that we accept application 14-73 as it stands. Second. Motion and second. Uh, discussion by the board. I think it's a, a good move the city's making. There's been a pretty high demand for reclaimed water throughout the city, and it's run short a lot of times. So it's great to see uh, more opportunity for our citizens here for these guys. Good. Comments? <clears throat> I'd like to add that I'm, I'm glad to see not only the, uh, the increase in the facility for the uh, uh, reclaimed water, but that the city has uh, made a good effort to commu communicate with the uh, affected residents. And that's uh, one of my major concerns when I first looked through the application. And I appreciate the city going the extra mile to do that. OK, we're ready to vote. Mrs. Protos? Yes. Mr. Carr? Yes. Mr. Hasse? Yes. Ms. St. Arnold? Yes. Chairman Vincent? Yes. Next item on the agenda is uh, application 1448, annexation. Actually, there's several related parcels or applications. Uh, I'll go ahead and mention them all right now. And the other is application 14-47. That's a future land use and zoning amendment for racetrack parcel one. Application 1447, future land use and zoning amendment for racetrack parcel two. And application 14-59, uh, site plan for racetrack, gas station, and market store. Steve. Mr. Chairman, board members, thank you. Steve Coreccia, Planning and Zoning Director. Uh, with your consent, Mr. Chairman, this presentation will cover items 6, 7, 8, and 9 uh, in one general presentation and then separate actions like just before with uh, the city's facility. Uh, but this property is 1.8 acres located at the southwest corner of US 19 and Klosterman Road. Uh, the property generally consists of two parcels. We have parcel one, it's about 0.87 acres, uh, which is currently under the jurisdiction of Pinellas County. And that's the parcel that's developed with the existing gas station. Uh, future land use in the county is currently residential office retail and its own CP1 commercial parkway. Parcel 2, that's about 0.93 acres, that's within city limits. Uh, that's the site that's developed with the existing parking lot for the college. Uh, future land use is institutional and it's zoned currently public, semi-public. The applicant's intent is to redevelop the site with a new racetrack, gas station, and market store. Uh, to do that, four applications were required, and those are the four applications in your packet tonight. Uh, there was an annexation required for parcel one, future land use and rezoning changes for parcels one and two, and then a site plan for both parcels. Uh, the annexation will bring parcel one into the city. The intent is to change that future land use from county ROR to the city residential office retail and to rezone that parcel to HB, highway business. Uh, same thing for parcel two, future land use change will go 
to residential office retail rezoning to a HB highway business. The site plan included with the packet that it was, did show on a, almost a 6,000 square foot market store convenience store, 10 fueling stations for the gas station uh, with 20 spots for vehicles to fuel. A public notice for the annexation of future land use and rezoning, it did include sending postcards to surrounding property owners. We did provide all our legal ads to the paper. We also posted the property. In looking at each of the cases for an annexation review criteria, we are required in section 208 of the city's comprehensive zoning and land development code, as well as Florida statute section 171.043 they set out certain criteria for annexations, such things as the annexation will not create an enclave, that the city is able to serve the property with city utilities and services, and that the annexation is consistent with the future land use map. Uh, staff in reviewing these items, we do find it does meet the review criteria. As such, we are recommending approval of the annexation request. With regards to future land use amendments and the rezoning amendments for both parcels. Again, we have criteria set forth in the city's land development code, as well as chapter 163, part two of the Florida statutes. A couple of those criteria, and again, these are all uh, established in the staff report, so I don't wanna read them verbatim, but just a few of those criteria. One, that it would not discourage proliferation of urban sprawl that we would promote access across property lines. Uh, we would look at reducing a number of curb cuts and providing connectivity between sites. And with looking at the future land use map amendments for parcels one and two, uh, staff did look at that. We do find that it meets the criteria and we are recommending approval of the future land use amendments. With the zoning amendments, again, the, the city's comprehensive zoning and land development code provides certain standards that the zoning will be consistent with the future land use. And the intent is that the HB, the highway business, is consistent with the residential office retail land use intended for the properties. That the new use will be compatible with existing and planned uses in the area. Uh, the site is an existing gas station now. Uh, the intent being a, an, an improved gas station site development will be consistent and compatible with the area. And also that'll provide for efficient and orderly development. Again, it's an existing site. The new improvements should provide for greater efficiencies. So in reviewing the rezoning criteria, staff did look at those. We are recommending approval of the parcels one and two zoning changes. And for the site plan, we do have criteria set forth in section 207.02, 207.03 of the city's land development code as well as chapter 163, part two of the Florida statutes. Again, the site plan criteria. I apologize, I was quoting the wrong section there. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. With site plans, we're looking at section 210.03 for our land development code. And again, we're looking for consistency with our comprehensive plan our comprehensive land development code, including such things as our concurrency management system. Uh, we're looking at the future land use map. Is this site plan consistent with the category of our, that we're intending the residential office retail and with the HB, the highway business zoning? Uh, this application, the site plan did go to the technical review committee. Uh, it was determined that the site plan did meet the land development code, our comp plan, as such, we are recommending approval of the site plan. Um, overall, Mr. Chairman, uh, board members, staff is re recommending approval of all four applications uh, for the reasons mentioned in the staff reports and with this presentation. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my part of the presentation. I'm available for any questions. Any questions for the staff on the presentation? Yeah. They have met. <laughs> this plan every criteria that is requested by the city Mr. they Chairman. left nothing 
to come back. They've met everything they're supposed to meet in this. And reading through this, I wanted to make sure. Mr. Chairman, board members, yes, and the technical review committee staff and looking at this, uh, we are comfortable with this application, the site plan, the amendment, the zoning. We are comfortable. Uh, the applicant is, is, to my knowledge, comfortable. They're ready to move forward to the next step. one hundred percent ready to go without coming back for anything. Yes, ma'am, unless plans change on the applicant's side, we're ready That's to move understood. them. That's understood, yeah. Now, the other question is, there's already a filling station, a gas station there. Is the police department in their traffic department satisfied with using the same exits and entrances that they have now with all the traffic? Did they make any recommendations to change anything? They moved them. They made them uh, farther from the intersection. I wanted in from him in the well, minutes. Well, the applicant, I'm sure, will explain yeah, that. Yeah, I want it in plan. the minutes here well, from the, the planning department we'll for a reason. I don't want them coming back and blaming us. Mr. Chairman, board members, yes, that is correct. They did move the, the intersections further from the intersection. Um, technical review committee was acceptable with that endeavor. Again, the applicant can also explain. Right. Then that's cleared our planning department. And that's why I want it in the minutes. I've learned lessons. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, any other board member uh, have questions of the staff? Not at this time. Thank you. We'll hear now from the applicant. Good evening, Chairman, mem members of the board. My name is Katie Cole with the law firm of Hill Ward Henderson, 311 Park Place, Suite 240, Clearwater, Florida, representing the applicant, Racetrack. Uh, the applicant uh, applied. We've been in conversations with the city actually since springtime this was a bit of a complicated application due to the two pieces of the property one of which needed to be annexed in and the land use and zoning component of it um, so we've been working closely with staff uh, both your former staff and your current staff uh, with uh, Dave Healy being our uh, our shepherd through this process for the past several months and we appreciate all the work they've done uh, the applicant does concur with the staff reports and the points that they uh, made in the report with respect to meeting the criteria within the code, specifically to respond to Mrs. Protus's uh, question about the uh, access points. They have been adjusted. The police department and the fire department were both present at TRC and reviewed the site plan at that time and they have been adjusted to be moved farther away from the intersection in an effort to make a a better uh, functioning site and and frankly we don't have much evidence to add we do have the engineer here and the applicant uh, we're comfortable with staff staff report um, does respond to the criteria in the code to give you all the basis for approval we would respectfully request that I will add if you haven't seen one of the new racetrack stations this it does replace an existing gas station on the site I think you'll be pleasantly surprised with the difference between what's proposed and what's existing. While it is significantly larger, the architecture um, is also uh, very, very nice. If you haven't been to the Pinellas Park store or up in Pasco County at the Livingston store, that those are similar to what is being proposed here. I, the architectural elevations were at one point submitted to the city, but I don't know that they made it into your packets. So I'm happy to pass those around and if we can include these in the record as well. You have more copies. And with that, I'll, I'm happy to uh, reserve any additional time that I may have and respond to any questions that the board may have. Thank you, Ms. Cole. <clears throat> any questions from the board members for the applicant? Ms. Botus? No, it was very thorough. Mr. Hosh? No, sir. Mr. Carr? Ms. St. Arnold? No, thank you. I have just a, one or two questions. Sure. Um, I noticed the, the new parcel is the uh, purchased uh, parking lot for the uh, college, is that correct? Correct, a portion of their existing now, parking lot. Will that still be uh, used as parking for jointly with the 
your business as well as the uh, SPC, or is that just going to be, uh, I mean, is it going to be any kind of a shared parking facility? There is not shared parking on the racetrack site. Um, there is cross access, but the parking at the college still exceeds the required parking for the college by, I would just say, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> The uh, required parking is uh, 1,032 parking spaces for the college. They will, they will, there will remain 1,247. So the college does lose some parking that is now contained within the proposed racetrack site, but they have adequate uh, complement of parking remaining. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Healy. Mm -hmm. And the other question I had, Ms. Cole, was about the uh, the gas storage can uh, tanks for the product. Will those be uh, new tanks installed, or are they going to still use the, the tanks that are in place? Ask my there will be new tanks installed, and we do have racetrack here if you'd like to hear directly from them. Okay. Well, it was more of a matter of curiosity. I'm assuming that it, you know what's going to be done is going to meet the codes, but I was just curious. There, there's a specific process um, that's outlined with respect to removing old tanks, replacing tanks, and installing new tanks, and all of that would be followed. Great. Any other questions from the board members? Thank you, Ms. Cole. Not replaced. All right, at this time, we'll ask uh, if there's any comments from the public regarding these applications on the uh, proposed racetrack um, gas station that's on the southwest corner of uh, Klostman Road and US 19. Uh, if there's anyone here that wishes to speak in favor of the applications? Seeing none, is there anyone in the public that would, wishes to speak uh, in opposition? Seeing none, we'll close the public portion of the uh, uh, presentation now and go to uh, the board for motions. We'll need s four separate motions and then, of course, discussion after each motion. I'll make a motion of application 14-48, the annexation for racetrack. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any comments or discussion by the board? Seeing none, we'll have a roll call vote. Mrs. Protos? Yes. Mr. Carr? Yes. Mr. Hossig? Yes. Ms. St. Arnold? Yes. Chairman Vinson? Yes. That approves the annexation of the, uh, the parcel. So um, moved. Well, the next one is application 14-47. Do we have a motion on that? So moved for approval. I'll make a motion for application 14-47, the future land use and zoning amendment for racetrack parcel one. I need a, uh, yeah, Anita went ahead and made the motion. Oh, sorry. That's, right, That's second okay. It. Would Go you like to second, second the motion? Second. second. Thank Go you. Ahead. Sorry, I am so sorry. That's quite all right. That's all right. She made the motion. Have, I'll second it. Well, we have a motion on the floor, no matter who made it. <laughs> uh, any discussion on the motion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Protos? Yes. Mr. Carr? Yes. Mr. Hasse? Yes. Ms. St. Arnold? Yes. Chairman Vinson? Yes. And we have uh, another application to consider. Is there a motion? So Two. move for approval of okay. 1447. Uh, uh, future land use and zoning amendment for a racetrack partial two. Second. We have a motion to second. Any comments or discussion from the board members? Seeing none, let's have the vote. Mrs. Protos? Yes. Mr. Carr? Yes. Mr. Hasse? Yes. Ms. St. Arnold? Yes. Chairman Vinson? Yes. And the final application is for the uh, site plan approval. I'll make a motion for this 14-59 site plan uh, site plan for racetrack, gas station, and market store. A second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion by the board members? It's going to be a nice upgrade. Welcome to Tarpon Springs. Right. Okay. We're ready for a vote. Mrs. Protos? Yes. Mr. Carr? Yes. Mr. Hasse? Yes. Ms. St. Arnold? Yes. Chairman Vinson? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Cole. Thank you.
<clears throat> Next item on the agenda is application 14-47, alternate dimension plan for Cypress Trails of Tarpon Springs. As you can see, we do have two related cases here, 1474 and 1409. Um, it's really up to the chairman and I guess the board as a whole as to whether they want to take them at once or separately. Mr. Langham, we'll go ahead and take them together as far as the presentations and vote separately as we did before. I'd just like to advise, and I don't know, maybe our attorney will correct me, that I think it's probably a good idea when, if, to vote on 1474 first make it contingent upon a successful vote, 1409. The reasons just, why, I'm sorry. I, I say that again? Um, I'll give the staff review and I'll remind you, but it, I'll give the presentation all at once, but you're gonna vote separately on 1474 and 1409. Right. right. And when you vote on 1474, uh, I'd advise you to make it contingent upon successful approval of 1409. It, the reason for that is, um, you know, we don't want to want to have an approval of a document followed by a document that may not be approved, because then you have sort of contradictory uh, message to the applicant, and uh, it it's actually suggested in the staff report, and I'll go over that again when it I. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, just but you might want to remind us at the time. I will. <laughs> All right, 1474. Um, it's an alternative dimension plan. This is explicitly laid out in the district requirements for RM10 that says that if for any reason the lot size or lot configuration needs to be changed, uh, you can apply for one and go through the condition of use permit process to do so. So this is the applicant um, not only following the code but following staff's direction. Um, in a previous site plan that we looked at in November, there were some questions as to should the lots extend to the middle of the road and and how do we best configure and, and make these lots a certain size to meet the code and felt staff had, felt staff felt it would be much cleaner and clearer if the lots stayed out of the road and the consequence of lots staying out of the road was that they would need to have uh, in, a, in a couple of cases lots that are uh, slightly shorter than what are called for therefore you have an alternative dimension plan in front of you. So I'll, I'll go over this staff report. Um, we've, we've seen a version of the site plan before. This is the same project. Uh, basically what we're asking for, and you can see on sheet one very clearly, they have laid out which lots are requiring a lot depth of less than 100, which is the normal standard, uh, and exactly what and where they are requesting. So that's the purpose of this application. You know we're in an RM10 zoning district. Uh, the background is we've, we've looked at this project a number of times and, and we have given some, some approvals previously to uh, 1214, a uh, land use plan and zoning amendment. Um, 1432, we waived some wetland buffer and sidewalk requirements and reduced some rear yard setbacks. 1433, it's pending. Uh, this board gave approval of a Pine Street right away, and then 1437, um, a sidewalk variance that was approved as well for the clubhouse. So this has some history to it. When we look at standards of review, uh, when we comparing it to land development code, uh, conforming with the re requirements of land development code, um, as I mentioned before, the way to conform to the land development code is to simply do an alternative dimension plan to, uh, to clear up a few of the lot uh, depth issues that would normally conflict but now wouldn't should this be uh, approved. Um, evaluated for scale, mass, intensity, location, size, height, style, and aesthetics uh, are, are a number of the, the factors that we need to keep in mind when we're, when we're looking at this. Uh, basically, as, it, as you can see on sheet one, we're looking at uh, 24 lots with a depth of 90, point, uh, 90 and a half feet, and then we're looking at uh, you know, a handful of lots uh, in phase two that are going to be at 95 feet, so just shy of 100. Uh, you know, I'll state in the staff report that the unusual configuration of the site and the presence of environmental man-made constraints uh, don't 
really allow the applicant to run a street streets the way he has and have double loaded streets um, and that's the trade-off you're, you're you're considering tonight is um, if if it wasn't for the alternative dimension plan it would be I, I don't know how feasible it would be to do streets that have lots on both sides uh, you might be able to have a street that runs around the pond and you have lots on one side but if you want to get lots on both sides of the street you have to make some concessions here uh, to make those lots fit you know and, and whether those concessions are, are worth the project or not is, is entirely uh, up to you the um, the site is difficult to develop it is a unique site it is constrained uh, so that's that's what we're looking at and the question is to Without this, would it be feasible? Um, that's that's tough to say. I mean, in this this economy, with the cost of building, with the cost of acquiring land, uh, would only building lots on one side of the street be even financially feasible? Uh, I'm not sure. I think it'd be difficult. It'd be very difficult to design a project with just half of the street with lots on it. So, having said that, um, the trade-off again is you're helping the applicant to configure. A bad site. Uh, you're helping him build into a site that is just has the pond in the wrong place and has a power easement and this stuff. Uh, your trade-off there is it's going to it's going to a require uh, variances to the buffer and it's going to have some lots going into the wetlands. It's going to have some lots that back up to a power easement. Uh, it, it it's going to it's going to have some scale issues. You're going to you're going to see a lot of buildings. Uh, when you pull up to this thing, they are, they are having to be put on a constrained portion of the site. They can't be spread out. Uh, so there's, that's your trade-off, basically, is, is the assisting the applicant with building the property versus uh, what we're getting, which is going to be a, uh, a site that's had to been basically shoehorned in here. So to go through uh, the rest of this, use with the use to which property may be put is appropriate to the area well certainly it's a residential area um, it, this is this is a residential project uh, consistent with the goals objectives and policies when you look to the uh, of the comprehensive plan we look at the comprehensive plan the comprehensive plan encourages uh, housing it encourages appropriate housing it encourages multifamily housing in the correct areas housing for for workers and housing for you know the, the population is shown to grow in Tarpon Springs, and we have to put these people somewhere. So, yes, this housing project does meet the uh, goals and objectives of the comprehensive plan, uh, with the exception that comprehensive plan really doesn't want uh, any infringement upon the buffer to wetlands. Um, however, in this case, a variance was granted, and uh, there is the entire buffer isn't affected; just some portion of it uh, has been affected. Uh, will not result in adverse impact to the environmental or historical uh, resources, certainly not historical. Uh, I think if, if all the wet, all the storm is designed correctly, I think we can minimize, if not eliminate, environmental damage. Uh, you do have some homes that are backing up to the wetlands. Uh, you know, the applicant, the engineer and I have had numerous discussions about how the gutters are going to work along the back of the roof, how the swales are going to run along the back, and all the water is going to be brought towards the street and away from the wetlands. Having said that, uh, it is possible that a storm event could overwhelm uh, you know, the gutters and the swales in the back, and you can get some sort of runoff into your wetlands. Um, so that's, that's just something you have to consider. It is, there's, there's some possibility there. Um, actually, I want to back up. I'm sorry. Going back to the goals, objectives, policies, comprehensive plan, uh, it, I'm not, I wasn't quite sure where to put this analysis, but if you look at the plan, uh, some of these lots do back up to the wetland themselves, and some of the buildings back up to the wetlands themselves. I spoke to the applicant about this, and I said, what's going to happen here? Uh, you can't put a deck or a patio back there, and the applicant's, well, like, we're going to do an internal sunroom, internal deck. So building envelope is what you see, what you see there is not the typical townhome building envelope for those lots backing up to the wetlands. It's not going to be a somebody's going to come into my office and apply for a deck. That's not going to happen. What's going to happen is they're going to have an internal screened or glassed enclosure in the back of the townhome envelope you see. So there will be no need to have steps and no need to have um, 
you know, a sliding glass door that opens into a backyard or something like that. The applicant is, has architectural solutions for what you're seeing. But I did want to point it out that if you look closely, you are going to see buildings right up against the wetlands. So if you were to step out the back, uh, you know, your, your building is at the wetland. So, but like I said, that applicant has offered mitigation uh, for that. Uh, conditional use will not affect joining property values. Um, I don't think it will. The, um, I'm not sure it's a value. Uh, I think Duke Energy might have some questions of, of how this project's gonna affect uh, the use of their easement and maybe the value of their easement. Uh, obviously, normally we, we, we do consider that effect uh, and we consider the, the good as well as the bad. The applicant has, has gone to lengths to explain to me that they're doing a lot of work here, uh, not only to create access for Duke Power to, to stabilize uh, some of the way that their machines can get around and do the maintenance they need to do. And, uh, and, and, and they've done everything they can to keep Duke Power happy uh, with regards to how their easement is going to look, how it's gonna function. And uh, you know the applicant is trying to enhance the value uh, of the easement, not destroy it. But uh, you know I don't have a, I neither have a, a report nor do I have a very strong opinion on whether this easement is going to be adversely impacted or whether it's going to be enhanced. Uh, I think I'll kind of let the applicant explain his enhancements for the easement. Moving on, um, conditional use will not adversely affect, uh, impact or exceed the capacity, the physical ability uh, of the city to provide adequate public facilities, including transportation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we'll talk more about this in site plan, but. Uh, the transportation's in, in good shape, uh, and like I said, we can talk about more that in, in the site plan. The utilities there, the, 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 the city has adopted, uh, TRC has processed their concurrency application, uh, and it passed. They, they, they will, you know, we will be able to provide them with what they need. Um, number seven, conditional use provide for efficient orderly development. Considering the impact of growth patterns and the cost of the city, uh, no, this is this this is a you know there's townhomes across the street. This is where we want townhomes, so uh, this this is the appropriate place for it, um, and this is this furthers the, the you know the city's goals of efficient and orderly development. Um, so I'll get to the staff recommendations on this one, and uh, we recommend approval uh, with with a few criteria, um, you know, keep in mind, we we're looking at a phase one and a phase two here. And uh, there are non-conforming lots in both phase one and phase two. And I explained earlier that the purpose of this was to keep the lots out of the road. It's not 100% clear, and there's a lot of information on these plans, and I've, I've worked with the applicant and the engineer for weeks to make the plans more clear. The lots go to the back of the gutter. So the curb and the sidewalk are in the lots, but the bless you, but the uh, the lots go to the gutter. So the gutter and the street are going to be separately platted. You can get in there, you can maintain them, you can do whatever you want, and you're not in people's lots. The right of way will be platted to include the gutter, and the roads. Having said that, you'll see a dotted line there. That's an easement. That easement will allow for the homeowner association and basically their designee to maintain the curb and the sidewalk, which will be on, on the lots themselves. Like however said though, you can, you can see that there will be an easement and they'll work, they'll work to make sure that that provides full access for maintenance. So that's, I guess it's a compromise is what you're looking at. Uh, not, not everything is in public or private right away, uh, yet the important things, the streets and the gutter, and the gutter includes stormwater facilities are in the right of way without any need for an easement or anything like that. It's just flat out uh, separately platted. So uh, staff does recommend approval uh, contingent of course upon approval of site plan uh, 1409. Uh, two contingent upon approval of Pine Street right of way uh, 1433 by Board of Commissioners because they haven't approved that yet. Third Contingent upon receipt 
of letter of no objection from Duke Power for lot as well as stormwater facility encroachments into the easement, uh, I would say, and I've worded this better in the staff report, uh, for phase two, unless stormwater requires, uh, a stormwater review requires uh, use of the easement for phase one. Finally, provide a maintenance easement language to have the and have the easement language accepted by PNZ prior to vertical construction. Uh, I think that's just a given. We just wanted to make sure that it was noted somewhere. Um, I don't know if we want to pause for questions now or do you want me to go ahead and give give the uh, review for 1409 at this point? I have questions now, sir. Okay, so right now we're going to be talking about the, the modification of the size, the dimensions, correct? Yes. Um, as far as the questions that you want to entertain now, or do you want to entertain all the questions on the site plan as well as? I, I think we should limit our questions now to the, the lot size. Uh, I know there's other mitigating factors, but I think we can talk about that later because 1409 talks about those mitigating factors a little bit more. So I think l trying to limit your questions to the, the lots one through 24 is, as well as the phase two lots at this time would be probably better <laughs> and then we can ask more questions when I deliver the, the review for 1409. So having said that, do we have any questions about the alternative dimension plan? I want you to go over that again. Because, if I may, Mr. Chairman, at the last meeting when this was brought up to us, and I've gone through my notes, it was said that everything would be corrected and everything would be finished when this came back to us. We do not, do we have the letter from Duke Energy? No, but as I said, um, staff really feels that that is only necessary for phase two or phase one if phase one requires the, the easement, use of the easement. Well, that word if bothers me because we're gonna eat that if we don't have it. The second thing was, what about the lot line in the middle of the road to make a lot legal? What, what happened with that? We're not doing that anymore. That's the whole point of 1474 is that we no longer have to consider that. It's not a factor. So it's out. Yeah, that's, that, that's resolved. I want to hear from our attorney with these lines going through the, uh, the lots. Ten years from now, what problems are this, is the city going to have with those property owners. We've had problems before in the city with uh, utilities and um, uh, water retention going on people's lots. What security will we have that we will not have to have any problems, any lawsuits or anything if that happens in this development? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I think I understand your question. I'm certainly obviously reticent to say that uh, the city will never uh, ever get sued over this yeah. application or any other. I want to qualify that because you simply, I can't see 10 years in the future, neither can you. This, well, I uh, understand th that. I just want you to say, will, if this, is, if this is approved with this going through these lots, is this the end of it? No. Uh, no, but th this, in my opinion, presents no more legal risk than than uh, is warranted by its nature, I guess, if, if that's a... Um, <clears throat> there's risk with every application. There's risk with uh, uh, everything that comes before this board and before the Board of Commissioners. Does this, does this application uh, generate legal risk over and above that which attends every development? Not in my opinion. So why has it come back to us now if everything isn't rectified and everything answered? Um, the applicant has addressed every issue that we brought up last time at no, length. No, um, it hasn't. We don't have the letter from Duke Energy. No, we do not. The, and again, the applicant will explain that in, in, in that it may not be necessary for phase one uh, and that it's pretty simple to adopt uh, approval contingent upon getting letter before phase two starts. Uh, it's the applicant felt like that was 
and staff agreed that that was a possibility. Uh, it's, it's a reasonably simple condition to place a prawn on approval. Um, frequently, one thing you have to remember here is, is in other jurisdictions, you generally do have a preliminary stormwater approval and a final stormwater approval. The point of that is to, if, if the configuration were to change the, tonight due to your actions, uh, then all the stormwater is going to have to be redone. So same with landscaping and, and some other things. You get preliminary approval, and then if the configuration doesn't change, then they work hard and spend engineering dollars to get the final approval. But for them to spend forty or fifty thousand dollars on stormwater specifications on a plan that could very well change uh, is something we try to avoid doing to the applicant. We don't want to make them go broke. So unfortunately, in Tarpon Springs, we don't have a preliminary and final stormwater. So I'm left with a judgment call as to uh, are, are, is this stormwater you know ready to move forward, or is it it's so messed up that. Honestly, we, we can't even move forward. Uh, in this situation, I think it's clear enough that we have separate basins, and we have a phase one stormwater, and we have the, the easement for phase two, um, but I do have to make the qualification that the, the easement may be, re the, the Duke Power basins may be required for phase one. I don't have a determination on that. Uh, yet, uh, I, I think our applicant will, will say absolutely yes. I'm not an engineer. I'm not going to get between our engineer and their engineer. So I simply made up a good, simple condition that would serve to, to mark the, the progress of the stormwater report and issue, you know, permits based upon that condition. Okay, the other question that I, questions, and it may not be the time to discuss it. Did he agree with the city that there'll be no one master meter? that each residence will pay their own bill and we will not have that one meter. Yes. He did agree to not do that. Yes, and I'll, I'll let the applicant explain that, but short answer is yes. I just want to back up a little bit and answer your other question. You also said something about liability. What's a little different here is this is going to be private infrastructure. Um, so it's not the city that's, that's supposed to maintain uh, the curb, gutter, and sidewalk. It's the homeowner association responsibility. So if there's some issue with the easement, these people are going to get mad at their homeowner association, not going to get mad at the city. Well, we had that at Point Alexis in Harbor Watch, and it came back to us. And that's why I was referring to that, because there were quite a few meetings about that and master meter and all that stuff. So that's why I'm asking these questions. So we don't have to embark on that again in the future. Well, anything is possible. Uh, and eventually, yeah, 50 years from now, people could just blame the city if they well, want. I won't be here, so. But this is designed to have private maintenance, and therefore, there's less chance of liability, if I can say that, with a private maintenance situation than with a public maintenance situation. Did you discuss opening Spruce Street? Let's save that for application 1409. Okay, that's fine. All right, I'm going to go ahead and go through this. Do we have any questions about 1474? But we're not going to have the one meter. That's been no, planned. but I'll let the applicant explain any engineering details about how that might work. I don't want to get lost in details. The, the short answer is no. Because there were five stipulations that they agreed to come back and. Yes. Yes. So looking at 1409, again, it's a 95 lot subdivision. You got a phase one, you got a phase two. Um, Again, the background's the same as, as I read for the previous one. We've given or are working on, you know, basically five separate applications to, to put this plan together. With regards to the site plan review, um, as you do know, we went through and I listed a number of deficiencies at the last meeting. Uh, we feel like that 99% of those have been met. The only qualification I'll give on that one is uh, uh, we don't have a lighting plan. They're not required to have one. Lighting plan. Lighting plan. They're not required to have lighting, uh, so they don't have to submit one. I think they may come back at a later date uh, with the lighting plan, but right now they're not required to have one, and they don't have one. That's that's kind of the only reason. Uh, with regards to signage, um, you know, they've made notes, and that's one of the sheets you received. Last minute sheet three you received. There's a note on there saying, uh, "Yeah, they they will follow the sign code." 
And that's typical sometimes in a larger project where in, in, a, in, in, instead of including every sign, they, they have notes saying, we will have the uh, you know, no speeding sign. We have the, the, the access signs right. We will have uh, a lot of these smaller signs uh, that, that work for the, uh, the details of how the, how the parking's gonna work, the handicap, the accessibility, all that stuff. And B, um, their sign is tied into their public art requirement. So they're, they're working on that um, and they simply made a note saying, yeah, we're gonna meet, uh, we've done the calculations, we know how much money we need to spend and we know what's required of us and we are going to meet the public art and the sign requirements all at the same time and staff's perfectly fine with that. I, I would rather them take their time and do it right than try to, to put something together now that's gonna change. And typically public art is handled sort of last in the process anyway. Uh, looking at the comprehensive plan of future land use element, uh, yeah, they're, uh, they're discouraging sprawl because they're, they're doing compact development in a compact development part of the city. Um, it's, it's an appropriate place to put what they're, what they're placing, uh, utilizes existing infrastructure. Um, it provides housing. Like I said, the city's growing. We need to be able to house new population. Um, concurrency and level service analysis, they were given their certificate of concurrency. Um, transportation in particular, uh, I guess this is a good time to bring up Spruce State. First of all, they meet their transportation requirements. And that is due to a large part that there was a, you know, a turn lane and a light put in at the intersection of Jasmine and, and Tarpon, and it works just fine. I mean, I've done it a number of times myself, posting signs out there. It's a well-designed intersection. Uh, there, there may be some congestion in the morning, but uh, there, a lot of places in the city do have some suggestions, and they have a transportation impact statement to back up that says uh, their level of service will be acceptable. Um, you know, I think without that light, we could really be sitting here scratching our heads going, how the heck is this gonna work? The light is there. The improvements have been made. Um, the second part of that, of course, is Spruce Street. Um, you know, part of my job is to, somebody used the word shepherd earlier. Uh, part of my job is to shepherd these projects through, and right now, mixing Spruce Street with this project, I think, has the potential to make this more complicated than it needs to be, first of all, because the city has not given us a clear direction where they want to build Spruce Street. You know, if I had an order from the Board of Commissioners or the Mayor's office or even my city manager saying, we've committed, we're gonna do it, then yeah, we need to, I think this, this plan needs to address uh, Spruce Street and what it's gonna look like and how it's gonna affect and, and all that sort of thing. Right now, this plan is written uh, such that it could accommodate Spruce Street, it stubs out Spruce Street, they've built in Drain, extra drainage to, to handle the runoff from Spruce Street. So the applicant has done his job and he's ready to accommodate it, but staff has not asked the applicant to, to design for a project that has not even been approved by the city. So uh, despite whether, whether we think Spruce Street is a good idea or not, I would just simply caution that if we mix these issues too much, we kind of run the risk of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. So yes, Bruce Street would be good. Um, B, not only is it gonna complicate our site plan, it's gonna compl it has already complicated the stormwater and plan, and that's another reason we don't have as clear of a stormwater picture as we would like to, because Spruce Street has in fact muddled the issue. Uh, that's why I think a carefully worded condition is really the way to proceed with regards to stormwater. And frankly, the conditions don't address Spruce Street because it would be premature for staff to make any sort of Spruce Street recommendations at this point until, I, until this, you know, staff gets direction from the city. So that's my comments on transportation. Uh, art design standards, I've, I've discussed that. Uh, they are going to meet their commitments. So now we get to the staff recommendation. Um, again, I'll just repeat that we have a we have an oddly configured site and we are, we are having to do a number of things to, to basically get double loaded streets is kind of what it boils down to. Uh, we're gonna have some constraints here. You know, what, are, what are these townhomes gonna, how are they gonna function up against a wetland? Uh, you know, what, how exactly is that gonna be mitigated? Um, 
given everything that we've done, we have made a lot of progress towards making this work. Um, you know, I'll, it, it says in the staff report, although this configuration technically meets the density requirements, uh, there will be an impact on massing and appearance. It's going to, it's definitely going to look a little crowded, uh, but that's because there's a pond in the middle of this project. Uh, and again, I'll, you know, it reiterates the idea that you're not going to have a yard for some of these. Uh, if you do have a yard, you're not going to be able to physically step into it uh, if there's a wetland there. So that's, I guess that's a compromise of the plan. So staff does recommend approval, um, contingent upon um, you know, the approval of the other applications that are outstanding. Uh, contingent upon, again, a letter of no objection from Duke Power for phase two to begin or for phase one to begin if phase one requires uh, the use of the easement or the use of the, the power easement for stormwater. It's that simple. Um, you know, phase two to begin within five years. We talked about a time frame. We agreed upon five years. Sounds reasonable. Uh, subject to completion of all required road and utility improvements to make each uh, uh, phase um, self-sustaining, and I, I guess I didn't word that as well as I could have, but that's, that's the gist of number five. And it, the plan does do that. I'm not putting that in there because that's a deficiency. That condition is only in there because my engineers simply wanted written in plain language that two years from now when we're installing infrastructure uh, and there's some discussion as to how much infrastructure or whether this can be, uh, line can be run in this direction or that direction, that it's somewhere in plain English it says, each phase has to have its own infrastructure uh, in order to begin construction. They simply insisted that I put a simple statement in there that says exactly that. Um, number six is subject to removal of structures of, such as the clubhouse and all the other uses that are in phase two prior to commencement of phase two. I think that's, that's kind of common sense. Uh, contingent upon approval of stormwater plan. Again, normally we have preliminary approval and final approval. Tarpon Springs doesn't have that. Um, so what, what generally happens in, to make all this work is our building department allow, is going to allow phase one to begin and to, uh, while they're, they're getting all, any final details together, and this happens with all projects, there's always final details. They allow them to build one model building. And that gets them in there, that gives them something to show, something to sell. But they're not going to be able to build any other buildings until everything is satisfied. The engineers are happy, till, till the landscape plan is, is, is completely fleshed out. This landscape plan is the exact same as stormwater. If we had them do $50,000 now and you change the configura configuration tonight, they're going to have to spend another $50,000. So, uh, the landscape plan, just since I'm talking about it, uh, is adequate. Uh, we've gone over the requirements. They do meet the requirements of the code. We'll have to go back and double check to make sure all the dead trees are indeed dead. And then uh, he has pro he's provided an illustrative example of what the trees on the lots are going to look like, what the trees around the clubhouse are going to look like. Uh, staff is satisfied with the landscaping. So I'm sorry, eight is the contingent upon utilities and structure infrastructure to be completely self-sufficient. Uh, not Five. Um, five and eight are related. And nine, finally, like I just said, contingent upon final landscaping plan approval. Again, he meets the code. He promises to put uh, the mitigation required for each tree removed. We just simply need to go out and tie ribbons around trees and poke them and make sure they're dead, and, you know, get a harborist out there and make sure we all, we're all looking at the same tree and same species and the same condition of those. And that's, uh, that's typical. So, um, like I said, there's going to be checks and balances along the way, and uh, that's my staff report. Thank you, Mr. Langa. Any questions for the staff? Uh, start St. Arnold? Yeah. Mr. Carr? Can you just clarify, you said there's Project 1 and Project 2? Phase 1 and Phase 2. Yeah, the Phase 1 and Phase 2. Is this just Phase 1 we're looking at right now? No, the applicant wants you to consider both phases, and that's, that's why the, the contingency is in there that as long as they have their infrastructure in place, um, they should be able to begin the phase. And, and what, 
Can you explain to me then, on just looking at Exhibit 1 and 2, I've just been looking at the, the maps. It looks like the property runs straight to 19. Is that in the, the plans that we have, or is that part of the plans we have or not? The, uh, the, the parcel does. I might have gotten that parcel wrong. Um, the parcel does, but, you know, that industrial land, I, I'm going to let the applicant answer that because sometimes we have inconsistencies between the tax assessor site and the GIS and the zoning map. When you start putting all the maps together, uh, sometimes you do have an error. But the site, the project itself will go to the LC. See the LC green on Exhibit 3? Yeah. That is, uh, you know, conservation area he's not going to get into. So it's for all intensive purposes, that's the edge of the project is that LC. Project is not going to go to 19. It's not going to happen. There's stuff in the way. So, no. You can't. Um, just a, a question. I, I was at the last meeting. You guys reviewed part of this. What is the situation with East Pine Street? I mean, it, it's showing on the map, but is that still has to do with the, the type of land in between 19 and the project, or uh, it's what's kind it, of it bisects the project and, and it keeps the north and south. Uh, from being able to be contiguous. Uh, it's not in the city's long-range transportation plan I mean, in any way. There's a very detailed analysis of exactly how much is going to be abandoned, what it's going to cost, what it's going to look like, the meets and bounds were done, the surveys were done. So it's, it's you know, there's, there's plenty of commission recommended approval in a PNC board, I'm sorry, uh, recommended approval. and. Uh, it's, it's absolutely necessary for the project and uh, pretty clean. There's no outstanding issues just with that. So is that just uh, the city's giving up easement to the project developer then for that we're, Pine Street? We're, we're going to accept money for that. Okay, yes, that's what I was yeah, going to confirm. Absolutely. They're going to settle it just the way anyone else would settle a vacation of right away. I want to confirm that. Yes. Thanks. Uh, with the landscape plan, with this, uh, what's shown, it just shows like tree, shrub, shrub tree, grass. Um, is that typical for approval? That just seems pretty vague to me. To uh, it is vague, but uh, that's the way the code is written. When you when you read this code back and forward, it it's actually if you're not building, you know, commercial parking lots, uh, there's not a whole lot of tree, shrub detail in there when you're just doing residential it really boils down to a simple table that given a certain lot size in this case a smaller lot size for every tree you cut down you have to replace two period um, the only other part that, re that that applies to this project is uh, you know if, if if there's a, a buffer uh, or if there's a wetland you you know you need to put some trees to try and screen the buffer or wetland um, so those are the only two requirements and we came upon an agreement to where all the trees that they're going to have to they're going to have to cut down some all the trees that they're going to have to replace you know at two to one uh, are going first going to satisfy two trees per lot at a minimum then anything left over is going to go around the go around the wetland so it was a sort of a measured logical approach towards what do we do with the number of trees so it's, what happens when you have like the lot then that doesn't have any yard space the uh, lot will have enough yard space for two trees. For two trees, it will. As a matter of fact, they, they, they would like to do more than the minimum. Uh, you know, the applicant has expressed it. We'll put this down as the minimum, but we could absolutely, you know, we don't want to sell a, a bare lot. We don't, we want the customer to drive up to the building, and if the trees makes that customer happy, they're going to plant the extra trees. So they're, they're in this, to, you know, from a business point of view, to maximize the landscaping. I just, I could not ask them to do more than the minimum of the code. Yeah, I'm not asking that either. Okay. But. There, there's enough room for two trees per lot. Okay. With the, has there been discussion on um, the floor height? I mean, the level built uh, compared to the wetlands itself, because it seems like there's going to be a few properties built in the wetlands. Has there been a discussion on where the minimum floor is going to be for those? Um, height as an elevation? Yeah. As in, well, there's not a floodplain here, so. Um, so it just it's going to come down to an engineering groundwater sort of footing situation. If it's, you know, your your water table is going to be pretty high next to this wetland. So right, um, well, that's what 
mean, if they discussion is I would imagine, I don't know I'm not an insurance person but flood wise their engineer may be able to answer that um, you know that's that's a good question it's like how's how is the, the elevation going to be compared to the, the wetlands uh, I can't really answer that okay uh, and then with the aspect of buildings, yeah. part of a building in the wetlands is you don't see a compromise to the structure of concern. Well, first of all, there's no building in the wetlands. Just, just to clarify, there's not. Is it just a lot line then? I mean, my understanding was. Lot line is lot line is in the wetland. Because we, I the thought building is in the wetland buffer. Yeah, this is U.S. Okay, okay. And the Understand. building okay. physically is adjacent to the wetland. Gotcha. Thank you. No further questions. Thanks. Questions? No idea. None at this time, no. Okay. Mr. Potus? No. <clears throat> okay. And I suppose now we're ready to hear from the applicant. Mm -hmm. If there's no other questions for staff. Good evening, Mr. D Chairman and board members. Uh, my name is Bill Conrad, 3617 Town Avenue, Newport Ritchie, Florida, and I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, the agent for the owner, Mr. Lindiakis, and we have the owner here tonight, and we have our engineer here tonight to answer some questions. And so I've been carefully listening to uh, staff's report, and you know we concur with staff with staff's recommendation to move forward. Um, Historically, looking back, if you remember the last meeting, we continued because we wanted to take the time with staff to fully address the issues and, you know, to guarantee that the, this project would move forward. And uh, starting with, I think, just as a general statement, uh, staff has basically said, look, we're 99% happy with everything that's there and satisfied. There's a 1% out there still that is is uh, a potential area that still has to be refined uh, to that I would just say that there are conditions and those conditions are part of the approval and those conditions are going to guide and control this process to ensure that that one percent is satisfied and I think that that, that that that's accurate so assuming that I think also there comes a time where I think as, as a board you know you have to also rely on your staff on their hard work and they've done an excellent job by the way and this is not uh, a necessarily easy site but uh, you know there are issues environmental issues that we had to comply with and and we we had beginning with the concept uh, and I'll just go over briefly the key, some of the key points and then we'll get into the details and we hope to satisfy you and address the questions because I know they're going to be questions that's why we have our our engineer here when we started this process we began with Renee and we went through the process we did and, and went over the design we there was a fundamental decision made and has been continued that as far as the design goes to satisfy the requ lot requirements that what we would initially we looked at the option of placing the lot in the middle of the road which is it, it, given the fact that this is not a public subdivision given the fact that this is a private development that that would be acceptable the decision was made for a lot of reasons and of course staff today has come up with the same conclusion that it it, it makes a whole lot more sense and we have to use common sense in these in, in in these proceedings it makes a whole lot more sense just to deal with a minimal dimension go ahead provide uh, some relief on the lots that basically uh about the uh, wetland areas so you have to remember when you have a lot you have a wetland area that's behind it now the one thing that I also want to make clear and our engineer will confirm this is that we've we've taken this through uh, Southwest Florida Water Management District they're the body with, with principal authority to review and approve site plans with respect to wetlands, with respect to retention, with respect to runoff and all of those issues. Our engineer will confirm that. One of the things that we're required to provide when you look at that line is we provide a 25-foot buffer before we hit the wetlands. 
So when you look at those lots, you have to keep in mind there's 25 feet of buffer and then the wetland. All right. And so that, that is a consideration. And furthermore, from a design point of view, we obviously, it's the developer that's taking the risk, and I don't think the developer would want to do anything that would jeopardize the, sec the success and the marketing of these lots. So it would behoove him to do things that are going to be workable and saleable. So, so and that was, the ra that was the underlying rationale for the, the, the dimension, minimal dimension. As far as the balance of the issues with the site plan, um, I think w through all the different meetings we've addressed those, I think there's a comfort level, a 99% com comfort le level, and we're uh, more than ready, willing, we're, we're going to be required, and we will satisfy the balance because we have to satisfy those two to move forward. So basically, with that general overview now, uh, we'd be pleased to uh, answer any specific questions that you have. And that's why we have our engineer here and uh, the owner. Thank you, Mr. Conrad. <coughs> there are questions from the board for uh, the applicant? Oh. Hi, my name is Manuel Lindiakis. I live at 773 Anklote Landings Drive, Tarpon Springs, Florida. And uh, as we discussed before, um, we've been back and forth with the city. We satisfied all the requirements. This, this first issue with the non-conforming lots uh, was at their request, uh, which we've sat, we, we, went, we went ahead and we redesigned the plan at their request to move it behind the curb instead of putting it in the road, which legally we could put it in the road and satisfy the 100 feet, okay? The minimum lot size, we're still satisfying that. We're not asked, we're still, the minimum lot size, 2,000 square feet. None of the, none of the townhome lots are less than 2,000 square feet. Uh, I think there's some confusion here as far as us building into the wetland. None of the buildings go into the wetlands. They, the closest they get at, on some of the lots is at that 25 foot buffer setback. So when, when they're saying that we're building in the wetlands, we're doing, we're not building in the wetlands. Uh, the other thing that I think it's important is, uh, and he can come up here and address it. Uh, we, we've had swift mud approval since August. Uh, all the stormwater calculations have been done. Uh, so that's been addressed and, and that's a final approval. That's not a preliminary stormwater design. That's a final approval from Swift Mud for phase one and phase two. Uh, Richard will get up here and tell you that phase one operates separately from phase two. So uh, the retention for phase one is satisfied in its retention pond, and then phase two is going to be in its own retention pond. So there's no confusion. Uh, he'll get up there and confirm that. So. Uh, we're here to answer any questions. We, you know, we feel we've got a complete set of plans. We've been through this with everybody. Uh, as far as the lots that go up to the to the buffer, not having a yard, uh, you know, there's there's no room from a yard because we have to elevate that about three feet, and that's why we went ahead and designed the outside sitting area, the porches, within the envelope. Okay, so you'll be able to go outside. And the other thing that, that I'd like to note is that 25-foot buffer that goes around the five-acre pond is going to be made into a nature trail. And then it's going to extend around the other nature trail in phase two. And also there's going to be a little walking path around the retention pond on phase two uh, for, the, for the community. So, you know, this, this project is, is 18 acres. It's not three acres. You follow me? So, yeah, there's a few lots where the people won't have a yard in their backyard, but they'll be able to go outside and walk into that buffer and walk their dogs, and I'm going to put benches in there and nature, and you know, because that cypress head's a beautiful, a beautiful thing. And if you ask me, having the cypress head in my porch, is those are probably the, pre, the most premier lots there to have that thing in your backyard where you wake up and there's eagles in there and egrets and everything else. Um, so, yeah, we don't have a per se back yard where you can get out and walk on some of the lots, but there's going to be a, a community nature trail that goes almost 10 acres all the way around the property, which is a pretty unique, unique thing for the people that live there. Not to mention 
uh, the clubhouse, which is going to have all the amenities as well. Um, so, you know, you know, we, we really appreciate everybody getting on board. I mean, we've been working with them for six months. You know, like I said, this thing was supposed to be at this point back in August, but the city had problems, and, you know, I've been bearing it and, you know, white knuckling this thing for six or seven months now, but it looks like everybody's up to speed on it. We've, ex we've satisfied everybody's concerns, uh, and we just want to get started. So if you can please follow the staff's recommendation, that's all we ask. And I'll turn it over to Richard, the engineer. Hi, my name is Richard Kelly, uh, 8910 Tennis Court, Newport Ritchie. I'm here to answer any questions on, as the civil engineer on the project. Uh, just a few clarifications because I heard some concerns earlier about um, a future maintenance of the road and sidewalk. It's set up to where there's two tracks. There's track A and track B. Track A contains the road and the gutters maintained by the HOA. Track B is from the gutters to the sidewalks and then five foot beyond for maintenance of the sidewalk and allowance for private utilities, cable phone, things like that. Both tracks are dedicated to the HOA. Uh, easement law also provides a stipulation that, that if the HOA goes defunct or just doesn't do their job, that the municipality has absolute right to come in there and take care of that maintenance. So that should head off any issues now and in the future. Uh, as far as the ponds go, um, what Manuel said, the Swift Mud did approve um, with the concern that, that one and two were separate as far as stormwater and utilities and everything, and they are completely independent from another. Um, that's why we ended up getting the Swift Mud permit, was to ensure that they were both separate. Um, so I'll take any other questions you may have. What about the water meters now? What did y'all... Yeah, they're all separate meters. There's all there's no separate. master meter. Each no master each individual meter, meter yes. Um, if this board, and it may not fly, chose to send a, uh, a statement to the board of commissioners tomorrow night that the city and the developer needs to open up uh, Spruce Street because of congestion mm -hmm. on Tarpon Avenue around as you come out from road there in the cemetery which spruce street now has a light mm -hmm. um would y'all have a uh, problem with working with the city on opening spruce street for safety factor and uh, uh and uh congestion factor i'll let the owner speak to okay. that yeah. first of all uh we we've, we've done a traffic study that's been done by a professional engineer and and the existing conditions can sustain the 95 units, I would, would say that, and I think Mr. Uh, Josh uh, reaffirmed that. Um, bringing Spruce Street into this thing is, is, is uh, at this point, uh, is going to muddy the waters because I, I sort of like want to need to get started. But I will say this we designed our ponds, our pond is in phase two, is over designed. And it accommodates all of Spruce Street, including the vault and including all the runoff from Spruce Street, okay? But uh, we haven't reached any kind of uh, concessions on me doing that for the city, but I'm, I'm ready and willing to do what's fair and reasonable. I brought that up at the commission meeting. Now that brings another good point that, that uh, because this, this condition that the city wants to put on me with, with the stormwater easement with Duke, okay, uh, which we sh we'll probably talk about it later, but that's why we probably should leave it out now. But I, I can tell you this, we've got all of that volume designed in that pond, okay, as long as we can reach some kind of agreement with the city. <coughs> uh, if we don't put Spruce Street in there, that pond that you see on phase two will be cut in half. I don't need to make it that big, but we made it that big. I don't know how many cubic feet of runoff we're taking on. That vault we think was 70,000 cubic feet because we got a hold of the engineer that designed that vault. And then what we did is we did a preliminary design of Spruce Street and we put all that volume in there. Um, 
But like, like I said, uh, I'm ready to do what's reasonable and fair because I'd love to have Spruce Street go through, okay? It's in the city's court to do that. The good news is I've got the pond volume there to do it. Otherwise, the city would have to put a pond on the other side of Carl Flamer Ford and run about 700 foot of pipe. It probably cost you who knows what. It'd be a lot cheaper to just put it with me. But this condition that they're putting in there with this Duke thing could throw a wrench into that because uh, first of all, Duke has an easement there. They don't have a, a I own the property. They don't have a right of way there, okay? And there's nothing in, in the city's governing rules, if you read through your development review stuff, that says you can place restrictions like that on a landowner, uh, make him get permission from an easement holder to, to Read the regrade my property in essence. That's what all I have to do. There's regrade uh, that part of the property to to sustain the runoff from my project and all the spruce. Okay, I don't think there's nothing in the in the city that says that y'all can do that to me. But I'm not. I'm going to agree to it. I've already contacted Duke, and we're trying to work things out with them. But uh, if they're unreasonable, then the city might get left out on that part. You follow me? So I think that's something later. But I don't think that there's anything in the code that says you can make a landowner get permission from an easement holder to grade his property. You follow me? In fact, if you read under the stormwater retention, it says that your intent and your purpose in the code is to help, help a developer reasonably develop his property, not put constraints on there that, that are. Uh, and, if, and, and the other part in the code there, it says that you're not allowed to restrict somebody from uh, from contractual relation on their own personal contractor contractual relationship. But that's what that easement creates. It creates a an issue with the landowner and the easement holder. Okay, um, so that's going to be a little complicated. If you left it out, it'd be better. But if you leave it in, I'm going to work it out with Duke. And and when he was saying about how we're going to make it better from them, we're going to make it better for them because now they're going to have a flat surface to drive around. And get to their get to their lines. Um, well, so you know we're we're ready and willing to to help the city put Spruce Street in there. I mean we've planned that ahead. So now we're just waiting for the city to say, hey, let's sit down, let's figure out, let's do it. But the good news is I can put it all in there if we can work it out. You follow me? Okay. Well, just so you understand, I think it's our responsibility also the city's responsibility when there's a development with a developer to work out to open every street possible to make it easy for the residents of the development you have and for the safety factor of the whole community and the road that they've just finished now has been congested for the last five days and through the holidays unbelievable so anything that we can open which we lost out on one last two weeks ago is proving to be a detriment in the future for neighborhoods and for the people who live in the area. But that's my only uh, thing that I'm interested in. I don't know whether the rest of the board is or not because there's a light there now on 19. It will be easy for people to get in and out of your development if it's open. And I have a question to ask the board after the vote is taken and they may not want to do it. So. Well, I, th I think we, we've talked to the planning department. We talked to, uh, I, after that meeting, I went ahead and told them that it sounds like the, the commissioners got the money, they want to do this, and plus while we're out there, we could probably get it done cheaper because we're going to have the tractors out there and all this other stuff, and we probably could do it for less than 250 so they won't have to get a public, uh, send it out to public bid. So when I talked to uh, uh, Karen, uh, I don't know if she talked to Mark, but we, what we agreed to is, is it's going to make it we don't want to tie that with this let us get started with this and then we can work on that you well, follow the money's but the, there to do it but the good news is should have. i've got swift mud approval to take on all of all of the water for that so that that's a plus that's right so in short we're ready willing and able just waiting for the city to give us the go ahead and uh oh, we'll include that call it phase 2a if you will and uh, we'll provide a proposal and get cost estimate. Well, I think uh, the city's uh, consulting stormwater engineer is, is putting together a construction cost for that. 
So then we can move Any forward. Any questions that. for the applicant? Uh -huh. Ms. Botus, any further questions? <coughs> Mr. Hosh? No, sir. Mr. Carr? Uh, I just have a question based on what you talked about. If Because you said the, the pond size was designed to take on the if spruce is built, but then if it's not, it would be reduced. So as a plan, it's designed right now to be the big pond. We're approving that as part of the plan. So what happens if that, and then is it spruce isn't done, but then it's approved in the plan, what falls in that for the developer? I don't know if that's a city question or. Well, well because this is done in phases, um, I don't think we're gonna be starting phase, uh, phase two within the next six months to a year. I mean, it's gonna take me four months to get the roads in for phase one, and, and, and I think the city's ready to start Spruce Street in the next six months to a year. So it, I think we can agree to something. You follow me? No, the city's not. Yeah. Okay. I, I'd, my answer is I'd say there's no way we can uh, attempt to reduce the pond in any way because of speculation that it's not having Spruce will somehow require less. I don't have the full stormwater plan approved yet. So there's no way I can recommend reducing it. I say we look at it and take it for what it is and stick with what's on the plan. Yeah, I was, that's what, I mean, I, I saw what the, was on the plan and we talked about then is Yeah, we won't, we won't confuse reduced, things by that. Why. We'll just um, leave it as is, you know, phase one and then phase two becomes okay. phase two. And can you just, uh, the next question I have, looking at the, the pond um, and the 25 foot easement of uh, the wetland, or 25 feet of, um, up buffer, buffer of the wetland. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at the lot. Is the can you just define the line for me of what one I'm actually looking at is the buffer and which one's the the pond itself? Um, can I approach? Yeah, come on over. The um, this easement distance is going to go through. This is the actual. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Yeah. If you're, you're looking at sheet one, uh, the uh, heavier line with all the L L designations. Back here. Right. This, these are the only three that's already been approved that would come to the wetland line. The rest of them just go to the, to the 25 foot buffer line. Okay, so the buffer is the, to the is maximum. That, yeah, line right yeah the, the innermost line is the wetland, yeah. and then the then when, when offset is that is the buffer. Because either you guys or some other board will let us do that, I, I increased the buffer area all around the sides. I made it like, we only had to go in, like, I don't know the exact square footage, but say it was 600 square feet that we encroached. Gave y'all back almost 5,000 square feet by making it bigger all the way around here. Okay. Yes, we all, yeah. We all yeah. 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 Well, that was another stipulation from Swift Mud is the is the buffer that we encroached. That like we had to compensate for that in other places. So we've we've overplanted and, and increased buffers in places where we could to compensate for any encroachments. This is going to be a crowded development in there. We've really put a lot of. Uh, residents in here. That's a zoning, though, isn't it? I mean, that's you know, it's a it's a typical townhome development. Yeah. Um, I mean, your you your requirement is 100 foot lots, and some of them, uh, very few of them, will be as little as 90 and a half. So we're we're cutting nine and a half feet out of some of the lots, but um, it's a typical townhome subdivision. Well, I would say that that uh, we've got zoning of 10 units per acre. We've got 12 buildable acres plus a credit for the wetland area. So if we really wanted to cram them in there, we could have put about 130 units. <laughs> so we're 25% we're less than that. And again, the, the reason that they look crowded is because that's the only place we could put them. We had a five acre wetland to contend with and that 160 foot easement to contend with. Um, but I'd like to just keep in mind that we are given the, the residents there access to the whole 18 acres. They're gonna have a nature trail that goes around both phases, around the retention pond by the cemetery. That's gonna be a walking area, a jogging path, dog walk, you know, uh, and then that other area right on Spru uh, Jasmine there, that's not a retention pond. I'm gonna make that like a real, uh, like a real uh, manicured, uh, nature, you know, manicured garden, maybe a putting green or something, or, you know, really nice place where you can go sit. Um, so even though those are a little crowded there, the, the people there are gonna have more room than most people, you know, in some of these places. But 
That's the only way we can make it work. I mean, I wish if I didn't have that easement, I would have put everything over there. But well, it's just it. nice to see a whole town young man uh, making it and being able to do something like this. Mr. Carr, I mean, you have I more congratulate questions. Congratulate you, but it still bothers me. Let's got one more question about a uh, pond two closer to the cemetery. Uh, what's the runoff for those aspects? Because I know I think it says pond two right here. Um, and it's but butts up to the cemetery, I believe. So what, how does that run off, and where does that actually drain to, or is it the pond just perk itself and then go no, on the, to? No, the pond is is connected. If you look at sheet, I, I believe it's five or six. If you uh, pond two is connected back to the wetland, okay. So where all the development goes to either pond one or ten, pond two, that runoff gets directed back to the wetland. So it it doesn't ever dry out. It keeps hydrated and it doesn't change its elevation from what it currently is. So. Okay. And there's, there's safety fails, I guess, that it wouldn't like overflow and flood out the cemetery? No, no, it's designed to meet the 100 year storm. Okay. So it, it reaches that elevation in the current condition and it'll reach the same elevation in the proposed condition. Okay, that's all of my questions I have, thank you. Ms. Ann Arnold? No, thank you. Any other questions from the board? Anyone from the public wish to speak for or against this uh, application? Seeing none, the public <laughs> portion is closed. Uh, okay. It's time now for the board to, uh, we have, there's two applications. We'll uh, obviously, we'll take the first one first and then the second one. Uh, the first one is for the, uh, is it clarification? Sorry? Yes. Can I just see, can we ask about clarification with the, um, the attorney, city attorney and the city staff? Um, when the applicant mentioned something along the lines of the easement from Progress Energy and that it's not required by the code that he has to have uh, ample approval by the easement holder, um, I mean, is that something we need to be aware of uh, before we move forward with this and make a motion or? You've got some recommendations as to contingencies and conditions on the application. This is 1474 for the alternative dimension plan, one of which concerns the easement. Uh, it's my understanding, based on what I've heard today and my knowledge of the application, that uh, um, Duke Energy's objection to this, or objection to the encroachment into their, uh, their easement, potentially compromises the stormwater plan. And for that reason, it would go directly to one of the elements that you're looking at in terms of the conditional use. So I believe it is embedded within the code in order for you to evaluate that, uh, that condition, and it is permissible to attach that condition to the application. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I'd like um, whoever makes, makes any motions to be specific about any contingencies or conditions of the uh, motion. <coughs> There's been a lot of discussion about that. You know, Mr. Langan mentioned at the outset that uh, um, he might reword the staff report relative to condition three on the two power easement, and so I would suggest that uh, you consult him in making a motion for the uh, precise wording of that condition so that it's clear on the record. For number three, this under the staff recommendation. You're Correct, and I would suggest further that the motion, if this is the motion, I'm not suggesting that it is or should be, only that if the motion is to approve and to uh, adopt the conditions set forth by the staff report, that that be made clear within the motion. To be specific, I would use condition three from 1409 instead of condition three from 1474. It's worded much better. Floor's open for a motion. The motion is to approve one or both? It's one. 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 Taking one, one. For the, the first one we're talking is uh, 1474. 1474. Right. I'll move to make a motion to approve 1474 with the replacement of number three of 1474 um, with 1409. 
three. With number three and number 1409. From that 1409 and then contingent, that 1409 is also passed uh, and approved. All right, to be clear on the motion, are you, are you, the conditions of approval, the four conditions of approval as amended um, are intended to be included within the motion? All of the conditions? There are four stated in the staff report. You've replaced one with the condition from the other staff report on the other application. Right. Is your motion intended to encapsulate all of those conditions? Yes. 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 Thank you. Second. Well, we have a motion on second. Uh, any discussion on the motion by the board? This is on the um, dimensional application only. Seeing none, we'll call vote, please. Mrs. Protos? Yes. Um, with the conditions. <coughs> with the conditions. Mr. Carr? Yes. Mr. Hasse? Yes. Ms. St. Arnold? Yes. Chairman Vincent? Yes. Okay, the floor is now open for a motion concerning application 14 09 site plan for Cypress Trails and Tarpon Springs. Excuse me, just so I'm clear, this is this is the one that we're saying is contingent upon number three, correct? On the uh, what? all the conditions are worded correctly on this one. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's just that these uh, condition number three or contingency number three from this one that we're looking at now was grafted on to the one before. Okay. I'll make a motion that we accept application 14-09 with the conditions that are here by staff recommendation. Oh, nine, nine conditions? All nine? Yes. Okay. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the application with the nine conditions in the staff report. Mrs. Protos? Yes. Mr. Carr? Yes. Mr. Hasse? Yes. Ms. St. Arnold? Yes. Chairman Vincent? Yes. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask a question of the board if they so please to do, uh, to do it. Okay. Along with the, these two applications that will be going to the commissioners, I think, tomorrow night, right? No, we, yeah. And we, we postponed it for two weeks to give them enough time. Okay. Would the board uh, agree to send a statement to the commission that uh, because they have the funding and the financing ready that Spruce Street needs to be opened during uh, the uh, uh, while they are starting on this first phase for safety and uh, uh, safety for the residents there to have another access to a road and for to uh, eliminate heavy congestion on on uh, the uh, Tarpon Avenue. There's a light there already. Right. Half the road is there already. They just have to use their f money that they have to go ahead and do it. That's up to the board, the rest of you, if you want to do that. I mean, we can send, I was <coughs> told that we can send recommendations uh, to the Board of Commissioners on items that come before us. Okay. Do uh, you want to make that as a motion, and then we'll see if there's a second? And I'd like to make a motion that we send uh, uh, a statement to, or whatever you want to call it, a statement to the Board of Commissioners that uh, the city, working with the uh, developer, open up Spruce Street for an, uh, another access for uh, the residents of this development to have uh, for entering and exiting the uh, development because there's already a light at 19 on Spruce and half of it is already developed. Okay. Uh, is there a second to the motion? He's smiling. We can't do that. <laughs> 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 Trying to get well, whether you can or can't, I'm going I'm to comment on it briefly just because I can't help myself. Uh, to, to be clear, you are permitted to make recommendations to the board and applications that come before you. Now, technically, you've already voted on the on the application I that wondered. came before you on the on Mr. Lindiakos's development. Technically, what I wondered, we already voted. Yeah, you already voted on the application before you. So, 
technically, and I don't want to be too pedantic about it, but it is from a legal perspective, you're making a recommendation that is independent of any application. Uh, your code doesn't specifically give you that power. I think you can make the argument that this is tangentially related to uh, this development, but I think it should be put on the record at least that the opening of Spruce Street or anything to do with Spruce Street is not a condition of approval of the prior applications. I'm not telling them they have to do it. We're, I want to make a recommendation that they uh, look at it, consider it, and do it at this time. I can't tell them they have to do it. That's uh, up to the commissioners. But, you know, some of them may not think about it, and I think it's a good recommendation from the planning and zoning since we've been through all of this before they have. Uh, look I, at it. I think it's clear. We understand that uh, they're not required to, uh, uh, to put, put Spruce yeah. Street uh, open it up at the same time, but it's a, uh, a recommendation that's being proposed. Uh, is there a second to the motion? Yeah, I would second that. I mean, the, the safety aspect would be a question, too, at some aspect with cars going through, cutting through, avoiding the lights, but yeah, I would second that. Okay. We have a motion to second. Uh, roll call. Mrs. Protos? Yes. Mr. Carr? Yes. Mr. Hossie? Uh, yes. Uh, Ms. St. Arnold? Yes. And Chairman Vincent? Yes. Okay. Now, I don't know how you're going to write it up and send it to him, but I'm going to come and read it before you do it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know, Josh, or the attorney, how you're writing up that recommendation. Okay. Um, discussion items. Is the next item on the agenda? Josh? <clears throat> Thanks, Congratulations, guys. guys. Good luck. Thanks. This will be extremely brief. Uh, City Clerk's Office has contacted our office, and we had a meeting just last week, Friday, as a matter of fact. Um, they've been tasked to go through all of the rules and procedures for all the boards and um, make sure that the rules and procedures match the code and um, make sure that the board rules and procedures are, are somewhat similar between the boards themselves and not widely varied. So uh, they've given us some preliminary information, and we're going to work on that a little bit more and we'll get back to you in the future with any recommendations we have for uh, rules and procedures for this board. Okay. Thank you. We'll look forward to that. Are all of you provided with a copy of the rules and procedures when you're appointed to the board? Yep. Right. Yes. I was wondering the same thing. I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad to know that. Yes. <laughs> uh, next item is staff comments. Josh? I want to thank for the board for their patience. Um, this, as you know, has been a particularly difficult project, Cypress Trails is what I'm referring to. Uh, not everything has gone as smoothly as it could have, but I'll assure you that staff uh, has worked extremely hard in this last month or two to get this development on track. When I say extremely hard, I mean working after hours, uh, five calls a day, every day, to these engineers. Tell the engineer what they want to do. They say, okay, send it back. It's not 100%. I send it back to the engineer and say, do it exactly the way I told you to do it. And send it back to me. So what you see before you is, is something that staff has worked very hard on, and uh, I want to just kind of let you know that, and I want to thank you for your patience. We appreciate that. Thank you very much, Josh. Being that this is a planning and zoning board, Mr. Chairman, um, I don't know how to state this. This may turn out to be the best development in Tarpon, but it looks very, very uh, congested. It looks like it's just pushed together from the area photos and the maps that we've gotten. He's allowed that in the zoning. Um, I'm hoping in the future that the Board of Commissioners will take a look at the zonings again. Uh, and I, I stated this in front of Manuel before, uh, here when I came to get uh, some clarification from uh, help from Mr. Haley and the Planning and Zoning Board. I'm afraid something this congested in the future will turn out to be uh, an undesirable. I hate to use that word, but you see some developments in the county where it's very, very congested and it gets run down. I don't know that we can do anything, or if we can, the city attorney can correct me if I'm saying it right, where we ask the city to look at what they allow in their zoning uh, ish, uh, areas so this you don't get this congested see i like green space 
But when you get too many, you see developments around, you get too many homes close together, they start to go down. And this bothers me with this one. And it may very well, I may eat those words because it may be one of the best developments Tarpon. Well, we hope it turns out to be good. Uh, I don't but know. But there is, there is, talking about the, uh, the infill development, I think there's a trend uh, needed to um, have smaller lots closer in and make them, rather than the sprawl that we've been doing yeah. in the last 30 or 40 years in Florida, uh, to try to condense it more, in, especially in the cities, uh, make it a little bit more condensed um, and a, a different scale. I and think the backyards aren't going to be a problem. I think some people don't want a backyard. Exactly. I know so a lot I mean, of people I think don't those, want a yard. Those will sell just sure. as easily as the other ones. I think those will sell first. Yeah. The ones that back up so. to that wetland. Yeah. Yeah. But we share your concern that I, I think all of us do that uh, every project that comes before us that we really hope that uh, it su succeeds and will be a credit to the community. Um, and the, the other brief answer to your question is, is yes. I mean, you have the, you, got, the, you all sit as the city's LPA and planning and zoning board, so you have the ability to make recommendations to the board of commissioners regarding amendments to the comp plan and zoning code, et cetera. Right, you know, whether those to, and it may to do just it. be the aerial photo that's doing it to me. I just see tightness. And, uh, we, we would like to see something done with the lighting, uh, outdoor lighting ordinance developed, as we've mentioned before when you first came on, Josh. I know that's a, a lot of work, but uh, that's something that board, this board has been what are you Concerned. looking at in lighting, Mr. Chairman? Dark sky Just, ordinance. Um, the to reduce the, the glare from the outdoor uh, lights, uh, to make it more uh, uh, friendly to the wildlife and the people that want to see the sky, to have less uh, abundance of the light. You know, so that if you've seen these uh, shots from space as they go over Florida, you know, it's, uh, Springs, you know when the space uh, station a goes over, it's just all <laughs> lit up. It's, uh, you know, that's Especially the people who live on the water. Yeah. Um, we live on the water, and yeah. I know those the people, and I, we have people who come along the water and break in and take stuff off of boats and things like that, and um, it's really difficult because people have got all those lights on the back part of their docks. Yeah, and bright lights don't necessarily make it more secure. It's the way the lights are, the way, you know, so. Uh, well, there's a development going behind my property. We'll be starting soon. We're going to lose all the owls. They're going to go elsewhere. Uh, we're going to lose a lot of uh, night uh, creatures that come out. And it's sad because it's beautiful. But well, we know that, you know, whenever there's development, you know, we do lose, lose. Uh, the, some of the habitat. But, I mean, that's, that's you know that, it's gonna that happen, sort of comes with the territory. But we <coughs> hope that we can mitigate that as much as possible. I'd, I'd just like to add that if you haven't written on your plans and you don't need them, the interest of the environment yes. and saving the applicant money, um, you leave them. Be happy to do that. I wrote on some of that. The only thing, it, it's very, I know um, we got everything on the computer, on our phones. Um, I, it may be just me, but I can't, I couldn't open up all of it. Um, and therefore, I know this is a waste of paper. I've got you, but I would like to be able to pick up a packet ahead of time. Okay. Um, Anita does. So you won't be the only person. Uh, and uh, Mr. Carr sent me an email earlier today saying even timing, uh, you, you, you really didn't, didn't have enough time Friday to. Afternoon and but I mean, I was literally receiving last minute information. Absolutely. I, so I'm just we, we will try to if, get these. If we can, I don't mind coming to pick it up. But, okay. Um, and we need to know the week, a week before that there will be a P and Z meeting. Okay. Because I call up and ask, are we gonna have a meeting? Right. really need to know a week before so we can plan uh, right. that Friday to pick well, up. Well, we just changed these two. I think the, the year schedule was, was promulgated at some point in time. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe we need to just e email that yearly schedule for the yeah, year. Yeah, I'll make sure everybody um, gets that it. That would then. be perfect to be emailed. <laughs> there was just so much, it was just really hard and difficult to sit at this was a Difficult project, uh, absolutely. If you would, in the future, Josh, when you email the uh, backup materials, maybe in, in your forwarding email, just say, if you want a hard copy you know, before the meeting, let okay. me know so that for those who do right. want a hard copy. I'll take one every time because I don't have a computer. I understand. All right. I, I share a concern, too. With, I, I love getting the emails. It's great to be able to pull up whenever, I, wherever I'm at. If I'm waiting a half hour at a doctor's office, I can pull up the plans and go through it. 
time-wise is really kind of my focus is I, I respect the fact that this is a lot of hard work and a lot of information you guys are putting together. Mm -hmm. But we've got deadlines in place for certain reasons why you have to have these submitted to the city staff in this time because of the exact reason that needs to go on to, I mean, if they don't get it there in time, I'm sorry, but that's the way the rules are there for, and it sucks to, excuse my language, but it's not, it's not pleasant to tell the applicant you have to wait till next month, but out of respect for the board here and our time too that we, we set aside on the weekends yeah. and at nights to go over this, um, it, it would be out of respect, I think, to us to have it, I mean, I would ask for it like the Tuesday before the meeting. I mean, that's yeah. it's six days beforehand, um, yeah. and that gives us ample time to go over. It. And then there's, as we go over it though, I may have questions for you or for other staff that I won't be able to have answered on the Monday during lunchtime that I have at work to yeah. call you, and our schedules right. might not coincide, and so on. Right. So um, that's just a, a request I have in my respectful. I mean, I know that you guys do a lot of work, and I know this, this is not something that I would want to dig into myself and try to get ready for a meeting, but I understand there's a lot of hard work put involved, and I don't want to diminish that, but I want to ask for respect for us. Yeah, we had a staff meeting about it in response to your email, actually, and yeah, we vowed to, to do a better job getting these to you sooner. Thanks. And this yep. board has in the past on occasion when there's been, <coughs> you know, a complicated matter where we haven't felt that we had enough time that we have told the applicant and the staff that, you know, we're not going to um, make a decision because we don't have enough right. time to go through the materials when it's so voluminous and or so complicated. And so um, certainly if, uh, make sure your applicants um, know that, you know, we need to be comfortable with the backup that we've got the information to make the decisions, not just from the testimony and the presentations, you know. Right. I also think we should, if we ever get one again like this one, we need to have a work session. And that was evident at the last meeting. I think when you get a large development in here, um, well, that's sort of maybe, what TRC does. Yeah, so. maybe, but we yeah, can't. We are not uh, privy to the TRC meetings, and as a planning zoning meet, uh, board, and we may never have one. But if we've got a, a heavy one coming in, we need to have a work session with the staff before the meeting for understanding uh, information points of information. <laughs> And I also, am, I believe, I also feel that if a del developer wants to come here and he doesn't have everything ready, don't bring it before us because it makes it hard for us. You know, like this Duke Energy letter. That was a big brouhaha at the last meeting. He doesn't have it, and he was told to. And there were, there were, other fi there were five other conditions that he was supposed to adhere to that he didn't. So in, in, incidentally, your rules need don't to have everything intact for it to come before this board. Sure, yeah, and your your rules don't allow presently for uh, having work sessions. You can have regular meetings, or you can have special meetings. You, you'd, you'd be passing applications at both. It'd be a matter of timing, but your rules presently, as constructed, don't allow for work sessions. Okay, we'll bring it up with the commissioners. Now. Any other board comments? Mm -hmm. uh, I've got one other comment. Um, I brought this up before in the past, and I. Would don't want to let it go um, as a concerned citizen and kind of what recreational use has been diminished around Whitcomb Bayou uh, due to um, the, the shoreline restoration with the granite pill, uh, blocks and Stupid. the dangers that have now been created for kids and other people with no sidewalks for the city and a very highly traffic, foot traffic, bike traffic. Uh, water traffic, uh, road traffic, all above. Um, I think something really needs to be done um, on the city aspect of either developing some type of sidewalk use or some type of boardwalk or something that's safety oriented instead of just a shoreline um, restoration with, because it's become a, a sore site to the uh, people that come into town, the residents, and uh, many other aspects. So I don't know how that falls into our board, but it, if it could fall somewhere in that recommendation, it would be, I think, appreciated by lots of people in the town. Is this around the Bayou area? Yeah. Yeah. We did, we did uh, bring that up in yeah, the discussion yeah. afterwards, and the city uh, uh, informed us that they had 
you know, it was sort of imposed on them, which I don't necessarily buy it. But, uh, okay, there's the, a way out of that, I think. The Corps of Army Engineers. Right. But <clears throat> I think the city had input, but it never came before us. Never. No. Not you only know, that. That whole project didn't come before us, and, um, and there's others like that, that that have happened. And I don't know if it's just an interpretation of the code, but we might want to take a look at that. And, that, and of course, changing the code is, is up to the uh, commission, but we can make recommendations of that. Mr. You know. Chairman, you may know this because you know a lot of the history of the area also. I have been told by quite a few old timers here in Tarpon that that property was deeded in front of those homes by one individual here in the city. I can't remember his name. And that if we researched it, let's see if I've got this right now, the city was illegal or wrong in putting those rocks on some of that property in front of those homes because they didn't get permission because of ownership. Of course, that'd be up to the owners that, that are offended by it to, to research that. But, but they don't all know that, so I don't know, maybe we should research it. Yeah. I'm going to a title company <coughs> Friday to try to do it. Um, there is one item that isn't on the agenda, but uh, this is our January meeting, and according to our rules of procedure, this is the uh, meeting in which we're supposed to elect the chairperson yeah, that's right. uh, and vice chairperson. We just did it. We, just we did, did it temporarily. We did it a couple months ago. Yeah. But, and, um, I mean, is that? I move that it stays the same. <laughs> I second. It's over with. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, it's been ratified oh. then <laughs> next year. Aye. Okay. Uh, motion to adjourn? Yes. Yes. We're adjourned <laughs> at uh, 9.18. All right. <laughs>